Take it away, Steiny. All righty, Matt Stein, Matt Starrell, the Guru Johnson with you, and let's head out uh, to the phone lines and welcome in Larry Beal, uh, news and sports anchor for KGO TV in San Francisco, former ESPN anchor. What's going on, Larry? How are you, Larry? Steining, Guru, what is happening? Well, not the finals. A lot, <laughs> a lot with the Warriors. Um, you know what? Let me let me just we we've just been talking about the off season that they're looking at, uh, and it's complicated and it's fraught with danger. What what would you do if you were Joe Lacob? Wow. Uh, well, I mean, first you'd like to be able to figure out who your general manager is. I think that, that it starts right there because you want somebody that you feel comfortable with navigating what is a minefield of challenges. You remember a, a few years ago when I think it was Steve Kerr who said, you know, when the Warriors had Durant and they basically loaded and uh, this is not the real yeah. NBA. Mm-hmm. That, this is now the real NBA. This is the real NBA. This is, you have too many guys making too much money as they age. Uh, you have one guy punching another guy before the season even starts. Everything is on tilt and you have to try to manage all this through a a seven, eight month uh, season and it's seemingly turmoil around every corner. This is the real NBA. And Steiny, you covered it for, well, you covered the team that that really kind of invented this stuff. Right. (laughs) Going 20 and 62 for how many years? That that is what it really is. We've been living in a fantasy land for so long uh, that, um, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to just manage all of these, conflicting issues that the Warriors are now facing. And look, it, to me, it seems like they've already decided that they're going to try to keep Steph, Clay, and Dre together. Right. So I think the first conversation that whoever is in charge has to have with these guys, Steph is set. You can't really do much with his contract. But you, you have to have the conversation of, look, do you guys really want to ride this till the wheels come off? And if so, then we have to figure out a way to get you to do what LeBron did in Miami with with Bosch and Wade, which is, okay, we will figure out a way to take less so that the rest of the team can get more and we can keep this thing rolling. Now, is everybody willing to do that? Uh, You know, everybody nods their head yes until they start to look at the checks and look at the money. Right. That's where it gets dicey. And then kind of the walls are closing in from the standpoint of, of all these other things that I talked about, plus the, the collective bargaining agreement, which we haven't even seen finalized yet, is really going to make this more difficult. And that's, that's what all the other owners are trying to do, is to stop Joe and to stop Steve Ballmer from just throwing gobs and gobs of money out there. And, you know, you're going to lose your mid-level exception. It's just going to be really hard to acquire talent, given all that's going on. Yeah, and Larry, when you say all that's going on, it actually started with the Draymond Green punch. I was very passionate and emotional about it, Larry. I didn't know if one of the guys had to get traded, but then I kind of lied to myself and said the Warriors are going to be okay. They lost 30 games on the road, Larry. Steiny made fun of me, but I kept saying pedigree, uh, championship blood. And, And Larry, I'm still hurt and shocked because it never manifested and I was wrong. I can admit it. Can you share with us when something seemed off to you, Larry, about this Warrior team this season? Well, it was early. I mean, as soon as the punch happened, it changed everything. Wouldn't you love to be able to to see in a parallel universe, if that punch never occurred, how this whole season would have unfolded and where they'd be right now? Because I think it would have changed everything. Uh, certainly the relationships inside the locker room. It just took them so long to do the damage control to try to get everybody back on track mentally. And I honestly I have no idea what happened to Jordan Poole after game one against the Lakers. Remember he hit the six threes and yes. the shot at the end of the game was like a 28-29. Yep. It was a, a shot that Steiny was often comfortable taking back in the day. Uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> that's true. That's true. I didn't even uh, play with a three-point <laughs> line, but... Sh- <laughs> You still took it out there. Yeah. But, so, but what happened in the next, like, and there was so much criticism towards him, like, oh, that's a bad shot. You shouldn't do this, shouldn't do that. And then the next three games, he was he was just in the tank. So I don't know if somebody said something to him, it was a social media thing, or who knows, you know, what else is going on. 
because, you know, these guys live very different lives than the rest of us. But something strange happened during that series. And if Jordan Poole was the Jordan Poole we saw from a year ago, we might be having a very different conversation mm. right now. But now you have to look at the challenge. The biggest challenge is how do you maintain a championship core and also the pieces around that you want to improve while saving money? Those are two opposite goals that don't usually consistently get together. So how do you do that? Somebody, if the goal, and, you know, Joe Leggett told me this, you know, I think probably coming up on a couple of months ago, uh, we did an event down at Stanford, and he said, look, I, my intention is not to pay $363 million a year for a team that's going to lose early. Um, the goal would be to get to the finals. So, all right, you know, we know he would like to spend less, but how do you do that, and what can you flip some of the assets you do have into in order to lower payroll and tax while improving? That, that's really the tricky part. If you just said, well, hey, we could throw a lot more money at this, then you know, you'd have some different options. But now you have to figure out who's, who's disposable or flippable. Let's say disposable is probably the wrong word. Who's flippable that can improve your team or, or improve your team chemistry? Right. That's where it gets hard. That's right. where it really is challenging. Larry Beal joining us on 95.7 The Game, news and sports anchor at KGO-TV in San Francisco. Um, what what do you think is the most important part of this offseason for the Warriors? Do you think it's Draymond Green? Is it is it Bob Myers? Or is it maybe getting something for Poole and or Kaminga? Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes, and yes. I, I mean, again, I think you, it starts with Bob because he's going to do the negotiating. But I, I think you have to look at the, the, the unfortunate part with the, the two timeline thing is I think it was it was a really nice fantasy, but it was somewhat unrealistic. And I have to admit, I bought into it. Also, I thought it was it was going to be you know Steph Clay and Dre doing the baton handoff to Kamingo, Wiseman, Poole, Moody, and we never even really got close to that. It just shows you how hard it is. But I, I think the rest of the league probably has a higher opinion of Jordan Poole than we do, or maybe the team does from watching him every single day. But, you know, you have to focus on his upside. And I think you could sell, hey, look, just wipe this season away. This is a talented scorer, uh, but mentally we were never on the same page. I, I would think Poole would be the guy to go if you, if you because he, he probably has the most value. He and Kaminga. I wish I knew really what happened in this Lakers series because when you're being out muscled and you're outsized, he's the one guy on the roster mm. that could give you the athleticism that you know might give you a few minutes against LeBron or others, and he just couldn't even get on the court unless it was garbage time. So. The, the fear, and I, I can tell you this you know, from some of the organization, is whether it's Wiseman, and there was there was it was pretty unanimous towards the end of that that he was not going to develop into the player that they had hoped, but also that Kaminga is only twenty one. I mean, think about where we all were at age twenty one, right? Yep. not that mature. What is he going to be in five years? He could be an absolute monster in five years. Do the Warriors have five years to wait for that? Not really. So it's hard. It's really hard. You know, I'm, I was, I'll just tell you the story. I joke in the office, and, and uh, every time I say something ridiculous, you know how uh, they do it on inside and Ernie writes these notes? Yeah. yeah. They, they put up the, the post notes of the stupid things that I say constantly, and we go back and revisit them just for laughs. The, I was a Franz Wagner guy going into that draft when they took Kaminga because mm. he fell to them. And I and so I keep saying, oh, Franz Wagner, Franz Wagner, and guys roasting me all the time. <laughs> Franz Wagner would have been perfect for this Man. team. Uh, he, he scores like 20 a game in year two, and he knows how to play. You could just plug him right in. But, you know, uh, it was hard to pass up Kaminga at seven with the athleticism and the potential. So um, they, they need one dude like that. One guy would have changed everything in terms of the mix. Because you look at look at Clay at the end. What was he, 3 of 19 in the yeah. last game, 2 of 12 from 3? He was exhausted. It's just exhaustion. They expended so much energy against the Kings. 
And then a grueling series against a more physical team with the Lakers, they were dead tired at the end. You needed a younger guy who could come in and give you something. I was surprised Moody didn't play more in the last couple of games. That's, I'm, I'm curious at some point if I get a chance to talk to Steve soon. Um, and I, I don't think he's, he may not be terribly forthcoming on that. But I would have been, I would have liked to see what Moody could have brought to the table because I thought he really had, um, had raised his game in the last month or so. Larry, let me run this by you uh, because Steve Kerr, as you know, is a made man, one of the greatest coaches to ever do it. But I told Stani and the listeners, I didn't think you did a good job this year with the youngsters, and I'll leave that there. But we get to talk to Myers on our executive show every other week, and he talked about Andre Guadala and his presence and you know what he was there for and the behind the scenes. Larry, am I being too over the top when I criticize – basically a scholarship from Iguodala because they got no production. But in a year where we saw guys pouting, we saw guys hitting each other, that to me was the bridge. That was where Andre was supposed to, you you know, show us his moxie and his veteran savvy. Larry, I feel like from the outside looking in, I feel like they got nothing from that. Is that too over the top for you? Yeah, that's over the top. I have a feeling, and I would love somebody like Marcus Thompson to write the behind-the-scenes story of this season of the Warriors. And I have a feeling there's probably ten times more crises behind the scenes than we have any knowledge mm. of. So my guess would be that, that Andre was trying to help the coaching staff put out fires left and right. I just had that sense. They were out of whack all year long. They're, at no point, mm. they had a couple of five-game winning streaks, but at no point did they resemble anything close to a championship team. And I think it was really, it was quite revealing in the interviews after the Lakers series. They all said it. They all knew it all along and couldn't do anything to fix it. So I, I, I understand the Andre thing. I would have liked, you know, another player, even on the minimum, that might have been able to give you minutes because you knew Andre's body was, was not going to hold up. But I, I also share with you some frustration. And I also think, and, you know, I'm, I'm not telling uh, tales out of school here. There is a disconnect within the organization uh, regarding players that get drafted and then how they get used by the coaching staff. This I know for a fact. So at some point there has to be this real conversation of, if we take this dude, are you really going to play him? And I think that was the the issue with Wiseman and uh, to a certain extent with Kaminga, because I don't think the coaching staff trusted those guys, given where their skill levels are. Yet at the same time, if you're trying this uh, uh, two-timeline situation, you have to get the young guys some quality minutes in meaningful games. And that really did not happen. Now, James had a whole bunch of other injuries and other stuff that went on with him, but there, you know, there is some frustration within the organization, and, and I think Joe was probably the last holdout on saying, okay, make, make the deal for James, right. uh, and we'll get. But, but there, there is this whole, I, I guess disconnect would be the, the only word I would be comfortable using as to what the plan is and, and what's realistic. Because they, this season they got started in such a deep hole post-punch then, then you're looking at, oh, we just went 0-5 on this road trip and the wheels are coming off here. i got to play all my veterans. And it just it minimized the growth that the young guys would have. And I think that's unfortunate. Although we, we might have seen a totally different team. Yeah. Hey, uh, Larry, great Thanks. stuff. Really appreciate you coming on and uh, good stuff uh, during the playoffs. And I guess uh, you're, you're still working, uh, doing after the game, right? Yeah, we got a game, uh, we got a show this Saturday uh, after, I think, uh, Lakers and Nuggets, and then we've got the finals on uh, Channel 7, so we'll be there. Nice. We'll, we'll have a, a bunch of Warriors guests in, uh, and we'll, we will ask them the questions that Goo wants answered. Uh, right. tell, <laughs> uh, <laughs> tell Keating to quit wearing those tight pinstripe <laughs> outfits that does, it, it vibrates on TV. <laughs> Uh, I thought you just you were uncomfortable with the tightness. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Tell he, Coach hello. He, he's, he's a good, uh, he, he's oh, a good looking yeah. man. All right, uh, Larry, appreciate it, man. Hey.